Um, our speaker today is Amber Oliveros. Uh, she's originally from uh, Arizona, grew up on a farm, came, came to Portland to go to Lewis and Clark College. Um, and she worked in both the Obama and Bush administrations uh, in the Department of Transportation advising on workplace bias issues. Since uh, leaving there, she's come back to Portland and has founded her own company where she consults with uh, uh, businesses and uh, public entities on the workplace bias issues. So please help me welcome Amber and I'll hand it over to her. Do I need this in order for them to hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. I do, you do, okay, all right. I will see how to I won't use my notes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my name is Amber Ontiveros. I worked for both the Bush and the o Obama administration. I worked for the Bush administration for one year and the Obama administration for six years. And I own my own company here in Portland. We do change management related to equity. So we go into public agencies where we work with engineering firms, we work, work with construction firms. And I'm here to talk to you about some of the work that I do because I think the conversation currently isn't working. And this is really about my personal story and how I came to that decision. So now I teach workplace bias in addition to my change management work. All right, so let's talk about the issue. How many of you are CEOs or own your own company? There's a couple. How many of you are managers? There's a few of you. All right, this is the biggest issue that the economy is facing today, which is, oops, which is workplace bias. It is the most costly issue that is facing our economy today. We think that as CEO, as a CEO, we think this is the problem, turnover. What we do, what I do is I am a policy advisor where I identify problems and I pose solutions. This is not the problem. The problem is within me. And I discovered the problem within me. What are the top four reasons why people are leaving? This is a study that was done by McKinsey between 2020 and 2021. There were four reasons, and we're going to look at another slide here in a few minutes that shows the attrition and the retention drivers. The top four had to do with career growth, compensation. The respondent said, my leaders? You don't care about me. They talked about lack of meaningful work. Question, do you determine meaningful work for me or do I determine what's meaningful? This conversation is about unconscious bias. Unconscious bias, I now believe I'm a discrimination expert. I've investigated agencies across the nation and I've looked at discrimination. In my career, I found one case of intentional discrimination, one case. I looked at all the state DOT, all the transit agencies in the country, and I've looked at cities. In that time, I found many examples of policies that result in a disparate impact or discrimination, but not intentional, one case. All right. Let's look at this same slide. So the bottom quadrant are the attrition drivers. The top quadrant is why people are staying. So we talked about this. Why are people leaving? Because of how they feel about their employer. Are they getting enough resources? Why are people wanting to stay? Again, this is the same study by McKinsey. The number one reason is they will stay is because their work is meaningful. 
But this study was done between 2020 and 2021. During the height of COVID, people were sitting in their feelings for a year. I see myself in these numbers. So this, again, this is my story about me that I had to learn. I was angry with my work that I was doing. The current conversation isn't working. Flip side, happy employees, they're more productive, they're more profitable. What is the cost of unhappy people? $500 billion in the United States alone. Because they're not engaged. They're unhappy, they're stressed, they're angry, they're frustrated. 61%, this is a study that came out in 2022 by Forbes. They're burnt out. This is because of COVID. They were sitting in their emotions for a year. They're tired. It's impacting their physical and their emotional health. All right. What does all of this have to do with unconscious bias? So let's talk about the neuroscience of unconscious bias. Your brain is an adaptive processor. So you have an experience, you have an experience, then it's a it's an evolutionary process. You have that experience that forms a belief in your mind. And then you have a new experience similar to that experience. And what's happening quickly is your brain processes that information so you don't get eaten by a lion. That's what's happened. You don't know what the beliefs are that lie in your mind, right? All right, let's talk about a couple of, I'm gonna go through three examples so you understand how this works. Let's say you're walking along, you see a dog, it looks like this. It's angry, it's barking. Your mind forms a belief about the dog and about yourself. What happens, you see that dog, you now believe, I need to be afraid of the dog. I need to be wary of the dog because the dog is aggressive, right? That unconscious bias is keeping you alive so you don't get eaten by the dog. Now let's go through a couple others. There's an example, the neuroscience calls it the self-serving bias. So the self-serving bias is literally works like this. If good things happen to me, I attribute them to myself. If bad things happen to me, I attribute them to everybody else. Why is that a good thing? And then it's part of your evolutionary neural adaptive processor to keep you alive. Let's say you're unemployed. You need to get a job. So the way it works is you apply, apply for a job, don't get the job, you need to get a job so that you can eat. It protects your self-esteem so that you can overcome the challenge so that you can feed yourself, right? All right, there's another example. It's called the mini-me bias. Has anybody watched Austin Powers? Yes. yes. Okay, mini-me. <laughs> So the way the mini-me bias works is the neuroscience, they did a study and they found that uh, people, employers, they review candidates and they hire people that have attributes like yourself. Okay, so if you think about the caveman days, 
Why is that a neuroadaptive evolutionary process to keep you alive? Because in, in the caveman days, people with other, other tribes would steal your food, steal your women, and steal your children. So it's an evolutionary process for survival and reproduction. Now, what's the challenge with all three of those examples? Let's take the dog example. How many of you like dogs? All of you love dogs. I love dogs too. I have a little, little baby chihuahua. So the problem with this is that between the first time you saw the dog and the next, next time you saw the dog, how many of you know about that guy, Caesar, who goes in and, and makes the dog like better? It, it heals the dog somehow. You don't know between the first time and the second time whether the dog has changed. Self-serving bias. So what this presupposes is that if bad things happen in the case of the employee, they try to get the job, they attribute it to things outside of you. But what if they made a mistake? It presupposes you can't make a mistake. And as a CEO, CEOs, where are you again? There. Managers, where are you? There, there, there. Mistakes are the most important opportunity for growth. This is a false belief that we believe about ourselves. And that's not real. Let's take mini me. Mini me is y'all are going to do dope like me because you're like me and you have similar attributes as me. But it does not mean the selecting environment is such that you will be dope like me. Maybe, maybe not. The other thing is it often results in discrimination. All right. This is really my story. And I'm going to talk about the tools I created for myself. So people would hire me. So I'm a national expert. I wrote four civil rights laws. I wrote a law related to minority contracting. So all the transportation, like construction projects that you see, I wrote the law that creates opportunities for women and people of color to get opportunities on those projects across the nation. Title VI, which is a federal law. I wrote the law to ensure people, public agencies don't discriminate. People would hire me, my clients would hire me, come in, create change, create these innovative contracting programs. And then I would get this. Silence, crickets, nothing. I was so angry, so angry. I was frustrated. Those numbers that we looked at, I saw them in me. They weren't paying me enough. My work wasn't meaningful. I was pissed off. And one day I was using these, I created these tools for myself to manage myself and my emotions. And I saw this guy on TV who was mad over Black Lives Matter. He was angry. He was pissed off. And the tool that I was using is called mindful listening. So that you can hear what is below the words that someone is saying. And in that moment, I saw me. He was me. He was mirroring my thoughts to myself. What he was saying is, if Black Lives Matter, I don't matter. And that's not real. That's a belief that he believes about himself that he's not worthy. And in that moment, I knew 
that was the same thing I was thinking about myself with my clients. It's not real. We need to learn to love ourselves and to heal each other and come together. What's this costing turnover? This is also another study came out in 2022 by McKinsey. $21,000 per employee. They calculated, calculated it based on the cost of training, recruiting, and ramp up time. And I actually think this number is low because it does not calculate the effect on morale. And it doesn't calculate the effect on leadership. <clears throat> How many of you have ever been in love? Okay, many of you. When you are in love, when you feel good about yourself, your poor little doggy could get hit and you would, you would still be okay. When you feel good about yourself, you view the world differently. How you perceive things is different. All right, we're gonna look at that same chart again. 75% of these have to do with how a person perceives and feels about their workplace. Question for you, employers, managers, do you determine meaningful work for me or do I? I do. So let's talk about the tools that I created. We just click it. What is Awakening Grace? It's a program to discover your unconscious bias and self-limited beliefs. The curriculum includes a variety of techniques, including growth mindset and mindfulness to help you uncover negative beliefs, understand how to use mindfulness, be compassionate, non-judgmentally see your negative beliefs so that you can transform them. It also includes self-visualization techniques so you can become the best version of yourself. It also includes affirmations so that you can transform those negative beliefs that are holding you back into positive ones. The key to our approach is it includes non-judgmental, compassionate awareness so that we can seek understanding. Let's create a beloved community together. All right. So this is a personal journey for me. I realized that what I was experiencing with my clients had to do with an unconscious bias beliefs I had about myself. And they were beliefs that I wasn't worthy, that I wasn't good enough. And I was projecting those beliefs onto my clients. So I've created a program and a set of tools for myself, for others. So the way that your beliefs work is they're unconscious. They're in your subconscious mind. You don't know that they exist. So your beliefs creates your thoughts that create your emotions that then create your actions. I didn't, I'm a woman, I'm a person of color and I'm bisexual. I didn't know I was a sexist. And my partner, former partner, I used to use the word man up with my all women staff. That is an action. Trace it back to my belief. My belief was I need to be a man. My belief was that in the workplace, we can't be emotional. Now, I'm not saying we should be emotional. I created tools so that I could learn how to manage my emotions. We are emotional beings. 
it is who we are, but we need to learn these tools. So it includes techniques on how to uncover your false beliefs, mindfulness. So why mindfulness? How many of you are athletes? Anybody? One, two, few of you. I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover a study by the American Psychological Association that uh, studied top performing athletes and their use of mindfulness. Top performing athletes. The study showed that they use mindfulness techniques. The best use mindfulness techniques. It includes a 15 minute practice to uncover your false negative beliefs. And top performing athletes, they don't just body. They train their mind and they use visualization techniques to see over and over and over again how to visualize dunking the ball over and over and over again. It also includes a play loop. And let me tell you about that. So I created the tool and I started listening to it. The first week, I had the, a recurring dream every single night, the same dream over and over. And the dream was that my friends in my real life were acting tr untrustworthy. So y'all don't know me, but I'll tell you why I had that dream. The dream, I had it because I was raped for many years when I was younger. The affirmation, the first three affirmations are, I am trusting myself. I am trusting my colleagues. I am trusting my friends. They also include statements like, I am confident. I am lovable. I am easily able to communicate. I am wealthy. I grew up poor. When you grow up poor, you don't know what it means to be wealthy. You don't know how to become wealthy. You don't think that you can be it. At night, your subconscious mind is the most permeable. All right, so I want to read a couple, read an affirmation. So it also includes affirmation cards. The whole goal is to teach the individual how to regulate their emotions, how to see their own false beliefs and recognize that other people may have false beliefs too. Because now I still experience racism, but it doesn't hurt me because I know I'm worthy doesn't hurt me. Here's one. And then I'm going to give you an example. Suffering is grace. Grace is suffering. Suffering is the rising of the teacher. Love all experiences. So in my work, I had a colleague who was absolutely being sexist. He wouldn't allow me to uh, create agendas for my clients. And I was so mad. It took me four months to use the technique mindful listening so that I could understand what was really beneath the words. And now I know this. How many of you have ever been threatened by you? Someone else has been threatened by you. Yes. When someone is being threatened by you, this is what they're really saying. I am paying you the highest compliment. There is something in you that I don't see in me. And the other thing is, for him, what I saw was, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. But you know what? You're also so badass. I wish you could have seen in me what I see in you, what I see in you. 
Yes. Sorry. Is that better? Thank you. So we teach this in as individuals. Because I think, while I think the current conversation around DEI training is helpful to bring awareness, I don't care about awareness. I'm a change manager. I don't care about awareness. I don't care. I care about changing our hearts and bringing us together. We are the same. If you don't think I am a racist, you don't know the depth of my pain. I have had to work within myself to feel good about myself, to not be scared. The fear is a projection of fear, it's not real. All right, I talked about this, the American Psychological Association, here's how it works. They did a study of top performing athletes and they found those top performing athletes that use mindfulness can overcome the physical and psychological challenges. And think about it. So let's say you're running, your muscles are screaming, your throat is burning. You hear a competitor coming up to you along the side. In that moment, what's happening is you have all these negative beliefs about yourself, which is, I should have ate more pasta, didn't drink enough water, didn't, didn't think about my competitor accurately. Those are the negative self-talk. The study shows that those that use mindfulness can overcome the challenge because they can sit in awareness of their thoughts. They notice them. And then they can find the focus within themselves to overcome the challenge. That's what the science shows. Okay, so I want to end my presentation by saying this. As a discrimination expert, I now believe that racism, blah, 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 it's really a symptom. It's a symptom of one false belief, which is for me to win, you must lose. And the other thing is, there's a lot of other self-esteem concept beliefs that lie within yourself. And those are the things we have to change. My goal, I am going to go across the state to talk about this issue so that we can heal ourselves as a race of people. It's not me, it's you, it's all of us. Questions, that's how you foster belonging. Questions for me? Yes. <clears throat> Oh, so I'm, uh, I gave up working. Your mic. I, I used to manage people. I gave up working quite a long ago, and actually, now I'm, I don't. Anyway, um, but if as a company you, um, any company needs that needs to have to produce something, and sometimes what has to be produced is difficult and no one wants to do it. So um, how do you communicate to yourself, an employee, a partner that, okay, I know you want your work to be meaningful, but part of what has to be accomplished isn't meaningful to anyone, but you need to do your share, I need to do my share, and We'll try to figure out a way to do it so that you only have to do your fair share of the crappy work. Yeah, so I will use myself as an example and I'll respond to the meaningful part of it first. You don't decide what's meaningful for me, I do. And so for example, as a CEO, 
I have to do all sorts of administrative blah, blah, blah. Like I have to do taxes. I have to do my accounting. I have to do stuff that I don't necessarily like. So the thing is, is I've now used it as a game. I'm, I'm a strategist. I like to do strategy. So now I'm trying to think about how can, how can I look at that administrative stuff that's boring and make it into how can I get the best tax write-off? It's, it's about you. So again, that's an example of we're, we're thinking of it as outside of ourselves. It's within us. When we feel good about ourselves, we view the world differently. I know, I know that's not the answer that you want. Other questions? Let's go and stand up. Great presentation. Thank you. When I uh, was listening to your um, remarks, I was kind of looking back at my own career and back, you know, 40 plus years ago, when I started to work, you know, there was kind of this expectation that you, you kind of start at the bottom, yep. you work your way up with promotions, you do a good job, you, you move up the, um, the, um, uh, the rungs of the ladder. And 20 some years later, when I was more in a position of management, uh, and I think this is probably true today too, people that would work for me or that I'd be supervising, they weren't satisfied about starting at the beginning. They, they wanted to kind of start at five rather than at one. And it was kind of always kind of a butting of heads there in terms of you know, how to manage those people because, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, on one hand, I was thinking, well, they're just not really w willing to pay their dues. They want to kind of fast forward and move forward more quickly than maybe is practical. Mm -hmm. So it was always kind of difficult for me to know how to really to manage those people, other than the fact, well, if you're not satisfied, then maybe you need to move on somewhere else. Right. And I, I hear a little bit of that in, in Jeff's remarks, too, in terms of, um, well, if you're not willing to do the work that needs to be done, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that it has to be meaningful to you, but nevertheless, the work needs to be done and you have a job to do or you can move somewhere else. So so let, let me respond to both of your questions, comments in a different way. So what we do is we, it starts with the individual. The individual has to learn how to care about themselves and change their false story that they're telling themselves. The other thing is then what we do is we go in and teach them the techniques of how to use them in a team. In which case, what I would do is take an example like this. So what we do is we teach them how to use the tools like breath work, and these these uh, mindful listening questions, and then we have them read a, a scenario so that they can uncover the false beliefs. Because in that situation, that is the situation that's playing out today with the younger generation. They are literally going everywhere and saying, oh, if you're not going to do this for me, I'm leaving. That's what's happening. And the thing is, is People need to understand in these group scenarios, then they can, cre it creates compassion between the teams because each of the team, they don't talk to each other. They talk about the scenario and they uncover what are the false beliefs that are going on with the people in the story. Because you want them to like mirror you want them to understand why am I getting mad and why am what what is it that they're doing and you want someone else to be able to get that perspective mirrored back to them so. um, when I was in college you know those few years ago um, I would go back down to Eugene and I would was at home and uh, for three summers I got a job at a local door plant mm. and of course this is um, you know, I'm stacking wood of one form or another, and that's really all you're doing all day long. Mm -hmm. 
So, and so of course, in order to not drive yourself crazy, you have to figure out right. how you handle that. So yes. or what you're really talking about is it's not really the job that's important, but it's what you bring to the job. That's right. It's the your tools. experience. That's right. That you got it. You nailed it. Okay. Thank you, Amber. I think, I think we need to wrap up now. So really appreciate your um, comments and, and very enlightening for us all to think about. Thank you.